evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Cameron. Um, I'll be your moderator this evening for the Libertarian Counterpoint Show. And my guests this evening are Brandon Nelson and David Dearson. Um, what we're going to do here uh, at the start of the show is briefly talk about how we came to the Liberty Movement. And the way I came to the Liberty Movement is uh, basically through reading and, and hanging out with a bunch of radicals when I was a young man. Uh, and uh, um, I jumped out of airplanes and carried a machine gun for a living uh, a number of years ago. And, and before I did that, I uh, signed an oath or swore an oath that said, I, I uh, swear that I will uh, protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. And um, uh, after I went into business for myself for a number of years, I discovered that the crushing burden of uh, competition and the vagaries of the economy were nothing compared to the steel-clad boot of the regulatory state on my neck. So um, late in my life, I decided to become a freedom fighter, and I currently uh, raise money for Pacific Legal Foundation um, and uh, have sworn to uphold their mission of destroying said uh, regulatory state. And that's uh, how I got here. A uh, little Ayn Rand thrown in, some objectivists, some rounds of drinking, talking about uh, you know all that's wrong in the world, and here I am uh, moderating the show. Um, Mr. Dearson, would you tell us a little bit about yourself uh, sure. and how you came to the Liberty Movement? Uh, sure. So I uh, just started at uh, Pacific Legal F Foundation, where you uh, do such a good job raising funds. Uh, I am currently a legal fellow that's pending the uh, results of the bar exam in November where hopefully I can call myself an attorney, but I cannot give you any legal advice yet, so please don't ask. I know that the <laughs> California Board of Bar Examiners are listening. Um, I became a, a libertarian uh, in high school. I'm one of uh, thousands and thousands of uh, Ron Paul kids. The Ron Paul uh, 2008 election, I had uh, felt very politically homeless. My father's a a conservative Republican, my mother's a moderate Democrat, and I thought uh, what both of their candidates was saying didn't make any sense to me. So I, um, I latched on to Ron Paul. Uh, I thought it was fantastic. I did a lot of libertarian activism in college, uh, where I headed the uh, UN, uh, UNC Chapel Hill College Libertarians, later uh, the UNC Chapel Hill Young Americans for Liberty. I uh, eventually uh, worked uh, after college at Students for Liberty, um, coordinating their campus efforts. Uh, after that, I worked at FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education. Great organization. Um, fabulous organization. They, uh, they do First Amendment work uh, on college campuses, as you know. Uh, and I was uh, so enamored with their, the strategy of the project I was working on. That was FIRE's uh, Stand Up for Speech Impact Litigation Project. Um, and I was so taken with the strategy of using impact litigation to uh, make a positive change for liberty that I decided I would go to law school. Uh, so I went to Vanderbilt. I just graduated in May, uh, took the bar exam in July, and uh, here I am at the Pacific Legal Foundation uh, doing impact litigation. Cool. Very nice. All right. Brandon, you want to tell us a little bit about how you came to the liberty movement and what you're doing now? Yeah. Um, I got my start towards liberty i would say probably as a homeschool brat um my mother was very fond of the founding fathers and their ideology the setup of a minarchic system with the constitution the articles of confederation before then but a lot of what really transitioned me from the independent that i had originally registered at towards actually joining re-registering paying my dues to the libertarian party was uh, it was reading the book Ain't nobody's business if you do, and it's a guide to the essentially how ridiculous consensual crimes and the the overregulation of that human is behavior. By Peter Rick McWilliams. McWilliams. One yes. of my favorite quotes is by many of my favorite quotes are by. Peter it's a fantastic book. I yeah. love it. But after after reading that, I came from being an independent. Like I had, I had always been in favor of reducing regulation in some cases completely wiping out certain sectors of government just mm -hmm. because they seemed irrelevant or overbearing mm -hmm. but there were other things that just I, I couldn't quite align myself with the LP on um, things like complete drug legalization or prostitution mm -hmm. 
Um, and reading that book was fundamental for me because it made me reconsider a lot of the notions that I'd previously held, and now I'm a happy anarchist. Happy anarchist. Many anarchists are happy and, and paranoid. You can be both happy <laughs> and paranoid, folks, and if you're an anarchist, you should be both. All right, well, so you have a little bit of uh, uh, insight into how we're here, and hopefully the, the thousands of people watching the show have, have a similar story to tell, and we'd like to hear it. Send it to Lee. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> All right, so uh, what we're going to talk about first is, is something that's in the news, uh, and it's uh, the idea of tariffs as a solution or a problem from a libertarian perspective. And who'd like to start? Well, uh, you know, I'm not an economist. Um, I've taken a few uh, introductory uh, IHS seminars mm -hmm. in my day, uh, you know, and I've read uh, Milton Institute Friedman. Institute for and Humane Studies for you folks who aren't familiar that's with right, it. Another uh, wonderful organization. That's right. Yeah. And if you are uh, involved in uh, academia at all, definitely get involved with them. Um, uh, they have uh, they have grants and funds, and they, they run fabulous programs uh, to learn some of this stuff. But, uh, you know, from my perspective, I think uh, tariffs are not a good solution to much of anything. I think it's a tax uh, on consumers. I think uh, free trade is going to make everybody better off. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think uh, making people at home pay more for goods from overseas is really going to help in the long run. I think mm -hmm. it's a little bit of uh, passing the ball back and forth uh, between the right and the left hand, not accomplishing much. Mm -hmm. Brandon, what are your thoughts? I agree uh, with a lot of what Mr. Dearson had to say. My my take on it is that, yes, it is a tax on consumers, essentially, because it's raising the cost of living, but it's also, it's also prolonging the, sorry, it's exasperating the, the inefficiencies in the market. Okay. Because yeah. if we can get a cheaper, more, or higher quality good from overseas, then obviously we're going to want to do that. We aren't really focused on where it's made so long as we can get it efficiently, so long as we can get it cheaper, and that benefits us so that we can spend more of our money on other things, on our families, on our, on our own pursuits, okay. our, our leisure. So artificially raising the costs of goods that had been produced more efficiently out of, out of the country rather than those that were produced inefficiently at home to me, it's, it's just not a good solution. Okay. So are we, uh, there's, there's a gentleman, I can use that term, I think he's as much as a gentleman as, as the rest of them. In the White House, uh, our, our president, uh, our current president, Mr. Trump, and he is, uh, has recently uh, slapped some pretty big tariffs on uh, especially China um, with the idea that uh, uh, China has been um, you know, basically manipulating its currency and, and uh, subsidizing internal industries uh, so that it is producing you know, goods and services at, uh, at basically below cost. And that um, being the, the uh, poor neg negotiators that the previous administration did, they, they accomplished nothing in trying to even the playing field, whether it should be their job or not. So um, do we think he's, he's on the wrong track then? Here's my hope. Here's my hope. I'm an, I'm an optimist, despite what I've seen in the world. My hope is that uh, this is a page out of uh, The Art of the Deal, and uh, he's uh, negotiating by drawing a crazy line in the sand and he's, he's mentioned in, in asides many times, why don't we just cut all this stuff out and go to no tariffs and no trade barriers? So do you think there's, there's hope that that's actually where he's headed? Or do you think we're in for a trade war which uh, led to or made or certainly deepened a great recession? And many people uh, think that, that uh, the, the uh, trade wars in the past led directly to shooting wars. So art of the deal or stupidity? Where, what's the vote here? I mean, I'd, I'd certainly hope that, uh, that it's not uh, a permanent solution, that it's temporary, and that we won't go uh, too much further down this path. Um, at the same time, I know that uh, you know, the steel industry is a good example of a whole lot of people uh, in our economy who are hurting and who I think uh, make up a lot of Trump's base. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I understand that there, there's pain there when, uh, when the economy shifts and what was once a vital industry um, is now uh, losing to competition overseas. And I understand. Uh, I understand the pain. 
um, and the friction that it causes. Uh, but I also think from a macroeconomic perspective, that kind of pain is an important signal. Uh, and it tells us perhaps that uh, our resources are not used most efficiently producing steel. Maybe they're used uh, most efficiently producing something else and outsourcing uh, steel. So I, I, I think uh, it's very tempting to uh, institute a measure that's something like a painkiller. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. even in it, to take that metaphor further, pain is a very useful diagnostic tool. Um, and so sometimes it, I think it's dangerous to uh, to ease the pain too much uh, because then you don't have to listen to the to the messages it's trying to tell you. Okay, cool. All right, and I think, uh, Brandon, rather than asking you to add into that, we do have limited time on the show. I'm just going to kind of throw out uh, a, a round robin as uh, economic liberty in, in this country is, is under great threat through, you know, regulation and law and taxation and tariffs and fees and all the rest of that. Um, you're, you, I think, when you ran uh, uh, for your elected office, you came in second as a write-in candidate as a Yes, as in the a primary. In I'm the off primary. to the general in November now. Oh, cool. Thank All you. right. Excellent. And that was in, in which district? That was the fourth district for the California State Assembly. Cool. All right. So uh, why don't we start with you? What, what, are, what are some things that, that uh, lawmakers could undo, because I think doing things is the big problem, I would, uh, to promote, I would be inclined to, to, to promote uh, economic liberty, uh, let's just start here in the state of California. What are what are some of your ideas? Well, um, I would say that decreasing as many taxes and fees as possible would obviously be a good thing. I think that lowering the gas tax would be a good way to start by making it less expensive for people to get to work, take their kids to and from school, but also decreasing the overall costs of commercial trade because. W with the with the Jones Act in place, maritime shipping has taken a rather large hit. Like it, it's not U.S. It, cruise. Hmm? Is that what you're talking about when you talk about the Jones Act? Yes. Okay. Yes. So you want to well that and all of the ships have to be U.S. made, U.S. constructed, but it it limits the supply of available shipping means, which means that we have a massive trucking system. Mm -hmm. So by implementing larger and larger gas taxes, which they've been doing fairly regularly in California, for instance, mm -hmm. you're increasing the cost of transportation for necessary items like food, water, gasoline, and I mean, it's it's bad enough here in California, but then you also have, if, if these same policies in place in California were transferred over to places like North Carolina, where they're currently under, um, under emergency situations due to the hurricane, it's just making it that much more expensive for those supplies to get in when they're needed most. Okay. All right. Mr. Dearson, you mentioned North Carolina. That happens to be a place you're familiar That's with. right. Uh, yeah, I am. Uh, I, was, uh, I was not born, but I was raised in North Carolina. I moved to North Carolina. I was a year old and went to uh, the University of Chapel Hill. Uh, good luck to everybody struggling with those uh, yes. emergency conditions there. Um, thank goodness my uh, my family and uh, my friends are all right. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I certainly want to uh, wish good luck to everybody back home um, with all those conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I agree with what you said. I think uh, I think you know you, you can make it complicated or you can make it uh, simple. Uh, Overregulation just uh, is the enemy of uh, of efficiency. Um, I won't go into. Uh, I was going to bring up professional. Uh, occupational licensure, and I won't. That go, might. Why yeah. don't we? T I mean, we could certainly talk about that right I now. I won't go yeah. into my feelings about uh, the occupational licensure of uh, attorneys, because I know the California Board of Bar Examiners is still watching. Yeah, there's but, many uh, of them watching. They watch yeah. this show like I'm a hawk. sure they, they do. They learn a lot watching the Libertarian Counterpoint. Yeah. Um, I I don't know if they pay attention. No. Uh, they they certainly could use to. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you know. There's all, all sorts of um, laws all over the country preventing people from uh, from plying their trade, from uh, you know, from from seeking to make an honest living, uh, for, which has been recognized in the law um, consistently and at various points throughout our legal history as a fundamental right to earn a living. Uh, so things like you know, barbers, hair braiders, florists, um, people who shampoo your hair at the uh, at the barber shop. Yeah, mine's very good. My, yeah, my hair you shampoo. need a really, uh, you need to take the extra 200 hours of classes before you could work on, 
on that, I think. Um, you know, all, all of these uh, added costs uh, onto something that should be very simple, uh, it really comes down and hurts, uh, hurts, hurts the everyday people. And again, it's, it's protectionism. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's very similar to uh, you know, helping the steel, steel industry at the expense of everybody else. It's, uh, it, it's really, um, at the end of the day, it's just a creative way uh, uh, to do redistribution. Okay, and then I, I'm not certain of the numbers. Normally I'm certain of numbers, but not this evening on this particular thing. I think 20 years ago, something like 17% of jobs required uh, some sign up, some kind of licensure, uh, some kind of credential. And now in certain states it approaches like 40%. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the inflation of educational requirements, I would see personally as, as a form of licensing. Because now to be an administrative assistant in many areas, you have to have a bachelor's degree. And when you look at the actual job description, uh, there is no reason for such a degree. It's simply that, that uh, they used to talk about the military industrial complex, and now we have the education government complex. Um, and the other thing that, that uh, we have the largest prison population in the world per capita, and maybe in the world not per capita. And when you get out of prison as a felon, you are, even though you've done your time, for the crime. Mm -hmm. You are prevented from um, obtaining licensing in many trades that they are actually training you to do while in prison. So it's a uh, hidden tax, adds to cost, uh, and uh, we see the, the huge burdens of uh, student loan debt that people are, are, are carrying. Even coming out of a we hire um, uh, legal secretaries and paralegals at Pacific Legal Foundation to acquire one of those uh, educations privately is tremendously expensive. So I think uh, I think that's a good thing, and I think that that uh, uh, leads us right into a case, uh, Mr. Dearson, David. I would like you to talk about the Minerva Dairy, which is a Pacific Legal Foundation case, and and an example of how I think ridiculous. Uh, some of these barriers to commerce can be. Do you want to tell us about the case? Yeah, sure, I'd love to. So uh, Minerva Dairy is a, uh, is a family company um, that has uh, made artisan butter um, and other dairy products, cheese and milk, uh, for over 100 years, actually. They started uh, in the late 19th century. Uh, and the, uh, the gentleman who, who runs Minerva Dairy now, the gentleman named Adam, is the, uh, I believe he is the fifth uh, generation owner uh, of this uh, small business. Now they primarily operate uh, in Ohio, if I'm not mistaken, but they sell a lot of their dairy to Wisconsin. And uh, Wisconsin happens to be the only state in the union with a prerequisite that before you can put your uh, butter to market, uh, it has to go through a grading process. The so this, is, this is a scientific process with test tubes and a spectrometer or... Well, the, I mean, to me, the really amazing thing about it is that it's got absolutely nothing to do with health and safety concerns. Mm -hmm. uh, it's entirely about um, kind of the subjective taste of, uh, of, of these Wisconsin regulators. So uh, these people taste the butter and establish... They want to make standard? sure that it tastes good, that it looks nice, that it's mm -hmm. a nice texture, they grade it on color... Uh, and at the end of the day, they take all of these various categories, uh, totally subjective categories that have nothing to do uh, with protecting people or you know preventing against food poisoning or anything Overall like that. Quality. They take these these entirely aesthetic categories and they lump them all together uh, into one grade at the end of the day. Um, and uh, if you don't have the grade, if you haven't submitted your butter to the uh, to the regulators to to get this grade on it. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm having a flashbacks from law school and the importance of grades. Mm. Um, don't remind me. Please. So if you don't do that, you can't sell, uh, you can't sell your butter. So mm. this, is a, this is a regulation that really has no rational basis in the, um, in the traditional uh, you know, welfare powers. Consumer mm. protection. Right, exactly. Health, safety, morals, welfare, the, the traditional police powers of the state. Um, it, it also has a burden on interstate commerce as a violation of the dormant 
Commerce Clause, which says, you know, states can't go in and screw up uh, the channels and the instrumentalities of interstate commerce, mm -hmm. that kind of regulatory so we, activity we leave that to the federal government. preserved yeah. for Congress, yeah. right, and they yeah. really relish the opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so since they're doing it so well, you know, there's really not room for, for states to do it, but uh, the, the, the Wisconsin butter graders mm -hmm. uh, can only operate at facilities in Wisconsin. So if you want your Ohio butter graded mm -hmm. in order to put it to market in Wisconsin, you've got to go to um, the federal guys, right? The, 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 the Food and Drug uh, Administration, the federal mm -hmm. government, and that is far more uh, expensive. And so mm -hmm. this ends up really putting non-Wisconsin dairy producers at a serious disadvantage. Uh, it favors Wisconsin producers, and it, it's also a, it's a mechanism by which Wisconsin can regulate, sort of regulate the dairy industry throughout the entire country because uh, they're the only state with this law. But if you want to sell your dairy in Wisconsin, and most people who sell things nationally want to sell it in all 50 states, mm -hmm. uh, then you've got to abide uh, by this rule. Most of the time, your distributors aren't, uh, you know, telling you specifically where each shipment is going. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just, it's again, it's raising costs, it's, it's decreasing efficiency, and, uh, and for no good reason. Okay. Uh, these folks make artisanal butter. They've been doing it since the late 19th century. Uh, they don't. Their their butter doesn't have the texture. It doesn't have the color that uh, that the Wisconsin butter you see at the dairy store has, and that's the way they like it. It's it's a different product. Uh, they're trying to differentiate themselves because they do things a little bit differently, mm -hmm. a little bit more traditionally, uh, and uh, and Wisconsin uh, makes that extremely difficult for them to do. Okay. And then um, I actually had the opportunity at a at a function for Civic Legal Foundation to taste their butter, and it was. Excellent. I need to tell you that if I'm, I know we're not supposed to pitch individual companies, and when you hear me rave about it, I in no way am I trying to influence any of the thousands of people in our audience to go out and buy Min Minerva Dairy Artisanal Butter. I'm not attempting to do that. What but was I the name of tell the you Minerva Dairy Artisanal Butter. But uh, I can tell you, my personal experience is that it's freaking delicious, folks. Especially, they have like a, a garlicky herb blend that is just, oh man, it was good. Especially with a nice glass of red wine. So, uh, so on the next show, we'll have to have a debate between you and the Wisconsin butter graders to debate the merits no, of I'll, the various I'll, I'll do what everyone does when they, they try to get around uh, a professional butter grader. I'll just slip them a bribe. Hey. And, uh, my butter will go right through. So let's move on to another ridiculous example of uh, uh, overreaching, overbearing lunacy uh, called uh, Chef Jeff. We, we represent, or Pacific Legal Rep, uh, Foundation represented Chef Jeff in a case. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, yeah, Chef Jeff is an entrepreneur. Uh, he's a chef, obviously. Uh, I don't think his given first name was Chef. chef. I think uh, it's, it's Jeff Tracy is his name. Okay. Uh, and he owns, uh, he owns several restaurants in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, where, where Pacific Legal Foundation, by the way, has, has an office. Has a, that's yeah. right. It's yeah. as, as, uh, an additional office. That's not a pitch either, folks. Um. And uh, so some of those restaurants are, uh, are in Virginia, the Virginia side of D.C., and there's one in, uh, in Tyson's Corner, Virginia. Um, and uh, Chef Jeff is an, is an excellent guy. Uh, he's an award-winning chef. Uh, he, in fact, from the National Restaurant Association, uh, he won the award for, uh, for Best Neighbor. I'm not really sure what that means. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, I'm impressed. Mm -hmm. So anyway, he's uh, you know he's a, he, he's uh, an institution there in uh, in the mm -hmm. D.C. area, and uh, just like everybody else in Virginia, I used to live in Northern Virginia for for a few years. Uh, his restaurant has happy hour specials, mm -hmm. and uh, Northern Virginians really love their happy hour. They go to the city for work. They leave five o'clock to eight o'clock. They want cheap drinks, mm -hmm. um, and they want them fast and often. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now the f uh, now the funny thing about Virginia is that it has very specific uh, laws about how you can advertise uh, your happy hour specials. Mm. Uh, for instance, you can call it a happy hour special, uh, but you can't call it basically anything else. Mm. If you're going to have it, that's what you've got to call it. So Chef Jeff wants to run Margarita Mondays or Wine Down mm. Wednesdays. 
he can't uh, use those terms to he can't use that creative speech to bring in business to differentiate himself. Mm -hmm. He can't advertise particular prices on drinks, and it gets so ridiculous uh, with the with the minutia that, for example, he's prohibited from advertising a two for one special, but of course he could. He's free to advertise that the drinks are half off, which doesn't take a genius to figure out is the same as having a two for one special. Mm. Um, so he wants to be creative. He wants to run mm. his business and attract customers and differentiate himself from the competition. But uh, for whatever reason, uh, the law says he can't do that. He's got to call it the same thing as everybody mm. else. They want apparently a very boring happy hour scene. Mm. Um, and I think a lot of people don't realize how, uh, how often the First Amendment actually uh, is good for the economy. This is an example of a First mm. Amendment violation telling him what he can and can't say. Um, that's really damaging his uh, his business. Okay, and this is this would be be a case of both sides of the First Amendment for speech uh, and prevention right. of speech. That's so right. So the First mm -hmm. Amendment, a lot, a lot of people don't realize, protects you against uh, uh, being. and I watch it. And uh, I want to thank uh, Dave Dearson, a legal fellow at Pacific Legal Foundation, who I'm, I have great confidence that he will pass the California bar, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to promise that I shall buy him a drink when he does. And Brandon Nelson, I want to thank you so much for, for stepping into the political morass here in the state of California um, and stepping in as a libertarian and coming in second as a write-in candidate. That's, yes, that's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking as I watch the uh, stuff scroll across the screen that, uh, that we might be again winding down the show. And I want to say uh, thank you so much uh, once again to the thousands of you that are watching. The phones are, are lighting up uh, as I've never seen such activity here before. Uh, this, this must have been one of our, our best shows, so I want to thank you very much. Thank and you have a good evening. Time.